Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Acts chapter 7, it's a rather lengthy chapter, so I'll read uh, right through some of these portions, which will be easy to do because of the message, the sermon that Stephen's going to preach. But coming out of chapter 6 now, uh, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jewish widows, were being neglected in the daily distribution from the church, and they were complaining against the Hebrews because they felt like the Hebrews were the ones that were overlooking them, and it was cultural. It was what we would refer to today as more racism. They were uh, being prejudiced as to who should get the distribution, not those Greek-speaking Jewish people. They're all Jewish, but some were of a different language, see? So... They decided that they're going to choose seven people who would serve the table so that the 12 apostles could give themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word and not get off their assignment because those two things really caused the church to flourish, prayer and the ministry of the word of God. So Stephen now, the first of the seven that was mentioned, he's full of the Holy Spirit and uh, he began to have signs and wonders done. Miracles happened through his ministry. Well, people began to refute him, uh, not, not of the church, but outside the church. And they began to stir up false witnesses, fake news against him and such, to try to catch him, to try to get him arrested or whatever. But this is where we are. And it says at the end of verse 6, and all who sat in the council. Now he's He's being judged. He's brought to a trial of, of sorts, a hearing. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. So something seems visibly happening, maybe some kind of a glow or something on his face that makes him seem look like the face of an angel. So chapter 7, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Asking Stephen. Are these things so? Well, they're false accounts. And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. Okay, now we're going to go into this message from Stephen. And we're actually going to learn some things that we didn't really see in the Old Testament. He's going to go through the history, some history from the Old Testament. But some of the things that he says isn't clearly seen in the Old Testament, but Stephen is bringing some context, and we, we believe that the Holy Spirit is teaching us something as well. So, verse 2. And Stephen said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. Of course, they're in Jerusalem, so they're in the land that we commonly refer to as Israel or the promised land. Verse 5, And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on, but even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession. What does that mean? Somebody said, I thought Abraham received it. Well, God promised it to Abraham and his descendants. But when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans and made his way down to the promised land, he lived in the promised land in tents. He did not own property. He eventually bought property to bury his wife, Sarah. Uh, but that was the only land that he owned was just a burial plot or a burial you know, cave, a place to bury his wife. But he didn't own any land there. So God promised him the land, but he... Abraham, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, they never really got to own it until uh, 430 or so years later when God brought Israel out of Egypt. And then that second generation went across the Jordan under Joshua's leadership and began to possess the promised land. Until then, the promise was not fulfilled. So God made a promise to Abraham that was not fulfilled for hundreds 
of years. And why is that? Well, the Bible says because the sins of the Amorites had not yet been completed. Well, God was going to take the land away from all these Canaanites, including the Amorites, Hivites, Jebusites, Perizzites, etc. He was taking it away from them, but he was giving them time to repent. And he knew that they were not going to repent, but he wanted to, to let them have the time to repent before he gave it to Abraham's descendants. So it was going to be hundreds of years. But Abraham himself had no inheritance or he had no ownership yet of the land that God had promised him. See, so this is what this is talking about. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage, this is Egypt, and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, God said. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Now, of course, as Stephen is sharing these things, all these Jewish people are sort of sitting there saying, yeah, yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, that's true. You know, what you're saying is all true. You know, so you're speaking the truth now. Verse 8, then he gave them the covenant, talking about Stephen saying, then God gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs, or we would call them the 12 sons or the 12 leaders of the tribes of Israel. And the patriarchs becoming envious sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. In other words, back in Canaan land, now Joseph was in Egypt, but back in Canaan land, the other 11 brothers and their father and family were still in Canaan land. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died. And he and our fathers, and of course he's accelerating the story, but the whole family of Jacob, whose name was Israel, the whole uh, family of Israel went to Egypt and Joseph took care of them there and eventually Jacob died. He and our fathers and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money. There's the, the plot that I told you that Abraham bought. Uh, that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies. In other words, like abortion, okay? Uh, making them expose their baby, babies so that they may, might not live. At that time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his in his father's house for three months, talking, uh, yeah, in his father's house for three months, but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned uh, in or trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them from his hand, uh, by his hand. Moses, uh, Moses supposed that his Jewish brethren, now Moses was raised in the palace, but the Jews were sort of like slaves in Egypt. Moses supposed that when he killed the Egyptian on behalf of the Jewish people uh, to save a Jewish person, that he supposed that that would have spread and people would have said, Moses is on our side. Moses is with us. He, God's going to use him to deliver us. He supposed that they understood that God would have delivered them by his hand 
but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them, two Jews, uh, Jewish people, as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you, as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian. In other words, Moses realized, Oh man, the word got out that I killed an Egyptian. Pharaoh will kill me uh, when he hears about this. So it says, then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian. So he fled Egypt where he had two sons. And, and when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord. So Moses is now 80 years old. When 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as, as he drew near to observe, the, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have seen the oppression. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Uh, this Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be ruler and to deliver by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Now, of course, these Jewish people are listening to Stephen's, what seems like a lengthy sermon, but it was it's not all that long. Uh, but they're saying, uh-huh, okay, we know that. Okay, that's true. Yeah, everything's right. But Stephen is beginning to set the story up that he's getting to because the fact that Moses was rejected, he's setting this up to be a precursor to how Jesus was called by God to be the deliverer of the Jewish people. And he also was rejected. Can you see that? Okay. Verse 36, Stephen goes on to say about Moses, uh, he brought them out, brought the children of Israel out uh, after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, 10 plagues and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God, by the way, the Jewish people really esteem Moses. So this is why Stephen is getting to Moses as well. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. This is he who is in the congregation in the wilderness, with the angel. Uh, this is he who was in the congregation of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. In other words, our fathers, the Jewish people, would not obey Moses, but rejected him. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. Verse 40, saying to Aaron, make us gods. Remember the golden calves? Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written also in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch, talking about a false god. You also, you know, you did some things for me, but you were also, you were treating me like one of the gods and not God. Uh, and the star of your god, uh, Remphan, images which you made to worship. You made images or statues and such to worship. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. These are quotes from Old Testament prophets who spoke about and to the people of God back then in the Old Testament. Verse 44, uh, Stephen goes on to say, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, and he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land 
uh, possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, uh, who found uh, until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophets, as the prophet says. Quote, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Verse 51. Oh, this is where the, the transition happens in Stephen's message. All, all up to this point, it's like the Jewish people say, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, we know that. Yeah, that's true, that's right. But watch this. Verse 51. Stephen says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Now, these Jewish people would say, oh, we're circumcised. He's saying, but you're not circumcised in heart. You've got things in your heart that need to be cut away because they're blocking you from humbling yourself before the Almighty God, believing in His Messiah. He said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold of the coming and just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, whom, uh, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Verse 54, I tell you what, this is the boldness of the Holy Spirit to be able to speak in this hearing with the leaders, the council, and this whole uh, crowd of people here. And Stephen, a table server, but full of the Holy Spirit, is declaring these things. Boy, I tell you what, this is powerful. Somebody said, well, he didn't use wisdom. Oh, yes, he did. The Bible says they could not resist the spirit and the wisdom by which he spoke. Stephen is walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Watch this. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. In other words, they were so convicted, but the pride of their heart, see that they weren't, their hearts weren't circumcised. That pride of their heart needed to be cut away. So they were cut to the heart. They gnashed at him with their teeth. Uh, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. While they're gnashing him in anger, I mean, they want to kill him so bad, he gazes into heaven, and watch this, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Well, the Bible says Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. But notice, when they're about to kill Stephen, Jesus is standing. Oh, let me tell you. Jesus is so proud of what Stephen is saying. Stephen is defending Jesus. Stephen is speaking the truth about Jesus. And so as they begin to gnash their teeth and speak that they want to kill him and such, Jesus stands up and, and Stephen sees into heaven the glory of God and he sees Jesus standing, standing at the right hand of God and said, he said, look, Stephen, right in the middle of this, he was caught up and they're so angry at him, but he's seeing the Lord. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stop their ears. They couldn't even stand to hear what he's saying anymore. It was so convicting, so enraging to them. And it says, they stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. They ran at him to seize him, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him in anger, in rage. Can you believe this? And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who, guess what, became later the apostle Paul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Uh, well, that could mean, you know, he got hit in the head with a, another rock and died. But it could also mean that God in his mercy allowed him to fall asleep 
and not to feel any more pain from that. But I want you to notice, similar to Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Stephen cries out, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Talk about love. They are stoning you. I mean, inflicting horrible pain on you by chucking rocks at you on your head, your body, I mean, everything, until you die. And here you are saying, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. This is the love of God. This is a person that is truly filled with the Holy Spirit. You see the, the fruit of the Spirit coming out of him, even at his death. Oh, may we be so fil- Spirit-filled that we're bold enough to stand for the cause of Christ, even in the face of death. And may our standing also have the fruit of the Spirit displayed so that we're not angry and looking more like the devil than we are like our loving God. Oh, Stephen is a hero. And when we see him, we're going to thank him and congratulate him because some things happen from here going into chapter 8 that caused the miracle of Samaria to happen in chapter 8. The conversion of Saul to becoming the Apostle Paul in chapter 9 And of course, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and salvation for the Gentiles beginning in chapter 10. This is a powerful book, a powerful progression here. That's chapter 7. Don't miss tomorrow. Acts chapter 8.